Welcome, uh, everybody, to the Business Technology and uh, Innovation Centre here at Atos' uh, London headquarters and uh, to the very first uh, Atos Virtual Connected Experience. The business landscape has changed so much over the uh, past few months, uh, six months or so for all of us. For the country's um, top digital professionals, it is undoubtedly um, a very challenging time. Organisations across the sector have had to adapt at pace to meet the uh, sudden, the unexpected demands of the, uh, the pandemic. But now, of course, uh, we're looking to uh, how do we move out of the pandemic? How do organisations shift? And what they're needing to do is to move from the short-term fixes to the long-term solutions. And very much that is what we're going to talk about today. I'd also talk about to what extent organisations are prepared, uh, to what extent, uh, to extent organisations are ready, and what your involvement is uh, in that. My name is Michael Colley, and uh, joining me to discuss uh, different tactics and strategies for uh, digital professionals in the, uh, the post-pandemic world, which uh, we hope will come, um, are, uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce uh, Margareta McGrath, Chief Digital Officer for Dell Tech, in the UK. Uh, Mark Palmer, who's head of public sector for Google Cloud. Uh, Melinda Lee Ferguson, VP and general manager for VMware in the UK and Ireland. And uh, Clay Van Doren, who's uh, Atos CEO for the UK and Ireland. Uh, moment I want to say welcome to all of you, but as this is actually Clay's place, I guess I can't quite do that, really. <laughs> welcome. But, Thank well, you. Uh, and we will have uh, lots of good chat as we go through on all sorts of issues. Now, to reassure you, um, wherever you're watching from, uh, we're, we're here at uh, Atos's London headquarters, uh, live. We're following um, social distancing, COVID guidelines, so much so that uh, Margareta over there, if I want to speak to you, I've got to wave at you over there. <laughs> it's a long way away. Um, and also our brilliant crew who are uh, filming, all following the guidelines, which are so important as well. Now, we've divided the event into three sessions. And in the first one, we're going to be looking at the dynamics of home working and the issues it creates in terms of security, business processes, and also the effect on the organisation's overall um, digital ambition. Second session, we'll be looking at uh, whether the pandemic, or to what extent the pandemic, is an opportunity for organisations to radically decarbonize, even to set uh, objectives like embarking on a, uh, a net zero carbon strategy. So we'll talk about that. And then in the final session, we'll be discussing whether newfound trust in digital services, and that's something to discuss, whether that can bring a step change in public sector um, digital strategy. So you're very welcome. Uh, let's get started. Clay, uh, let me, well, if I may ask you, first of all, uh, this is this virtual way of doing the event. Um, is, this, is this in itself the way of the future? Well, it, it's one of the ways of the future, right? I don't think we're going to get away from doing any face-to-face, -face, Michael. We're, we're still going to have face-to-face. -face. Um, but this will be an augment, augmentation, right? And it's great that actually we've been forced into excelling in this form of communication. And so we'll now have that in our toolkit, right? And you can see we have whole employee bases, right? We've got customers that have gone from 5% on-site to 95% on-site in two or three weeks. And now they've gotten used to it, right? They've figured out how to make it work um, with a lot of our partners' help here. So increasing numbers not working all together uh, again. So, I mean, obviously we've been sort of forced into it this time around. But you're saying this is good. This is something, in your words, to have in your toolbox. This That's is it. a way ahead. It is. It is. But... Most companies and most businesses will, will need this as well as some direct face-to-face -face interaction. Not all, right? But, but most. But you look forward to the opportunity when you can get face-to-face -face again. Love it. Where appropriate, love and, it. And looking forward to hopefully the next one, right? I mean, you know, pandemic permitting, right? Being face-to-face, -face, again, augmented by, by the virtual event. So therefore, the event in itself, whichever way it's done, why is this important to Atos? So it's really important to get together and talk about the business pressures, the business concerns that, that are sitting with all of us, taking a few minutes and stepping away and thinking about it, but doing it in, a, in the round, right? Certainly not in any form of sales session or anything else, doing it in the round with our partners, our customers, right, and our employees to, to get the best out of it. To what extent do you think that as where we are now, we are learning that sharing ideas is actually really important, and not just with 
our panel here, but with customers, partners as well? Yeah, I, I mean, we're on the journey, right? I, I think we've, we've been on that journey for some time, actually, as a society. Um, and diversity and inclusion and diverse thought, right, that, uh, that anchors that is, is really growing as an important trend, right, for delivering the best outcomes for society. Many of which, uh, in terms of outcomes, we're going to talk about in the, you know, the next hour or so. Indeed. So sharing, honest discussion, honest questions. Let's help That's each it. other. That's Key it. to this. You want to hear from... So, I was going to, so going on, yeah. so you, please, right, um, those of you that are online, ask questions, contribute. Right? We don't want to be locked down by the four or five of us in, you know, in this large room. Um, but we need, this only works if we get feedback from, from everybody that's attending virtually. Lovely. So audience, huge part of this. And also a great panel of guests as well. Lots of thoughts. Uh, Good amazing. Well, I mean, time will tell, but yes. <laughs> time will tell. There you are. Uh, welcome to all of you again. Um, now, so as Clay has said, uh, we want you very much to join in this event. Uh, you can use uh, chat if you're joining via the circuit or via uh, the LinkedIn group chat. Uh, your comments will be fed to me directly uh, in the studio, so uh, do make sure there's something I can uh, read out. Uh, I'll include as many as I can uh, during the event, and let's, uh, let's swap ideas, let's share ideas as we go on. Let's start our first session then. Um, now, to... To set the scene for each of these sessions, we've created um, a short scenario that we hope highlights some of the very real issues that organisations are facing as a result of the pandemic. Now, we understand that some of the scenarios you might go, well, that's not entirely realistic, that bit. But what we can assure you is that the issues they are portraying are very real issues. They are the issues that organisations, companies are facing and uh, need to address. So I'm sure that this, they are going to stimulate uh, thought from you and do let us have your thoughts and also from our panel here. So therefore, here is the first scenario. It features the fictitious Clipper Marine Insurance, which is uh, an international marine insurance company headquartered in the city of London. Clipper Mutual Marine was established in London in 1851 and is now a global business providing marine insurance for container shipping companies. While their product portfolio and their approach to marine insurance is perceived by the market to be modern and innovative, their business culture was, until the COVID crisis arrived, deeply traditional. CEO Piers Caddick had worked in the business since 1985 and was fiercely resistant to any change to the business culture he'd known throughout his working life. The London office was the hub of the business, and all employees were expected to be at their desk by 8 a.m. Homeworking was not permitted in any form. All employees worked from desktop computers at their designated desks. A range of in-house legacy apps were mostly hosted on the premises, and, in deference to industry tradition, any attempts by CIO Angela Voigt to introduce digital transformation and remote working were stoutly resisted even though the business had patently outgrown its head office. When COVID struck, everything changed. Clipper's London office closed for the first time in its history. But ships were still at sea, cargo ports remained open, and if the business was to protect its market share, it had to reopen as quickly as possible. Through a superhuman effort, Angela Voigt and her team made the impossible possible. Ten days after the HQ had closed, the business was back in operation, and all its staff were able to access selected office systems from their own devices. But some business-critical applications could not be accessed remotely. Teams were struggling to collaborate effectively on important projects, and security considerations took a back seat to getting the business operational. At the same time, the culture of using backdoor means of getting around the company's restrictive systems became much worse, presenting even greater security risks. Several months into the crisis, Clipper's senior management recognized that the business needed to change. In July, the firm had lost a major contract by overquoting because the business development team were unable to access their quoting application and follow their normal process. As a result, management now feared for other contract renewals. But they recognized that against expectations, the business was able to operate effectively with people working from home, and that they would never again be able to operate an office-only culture. So the board instructed Angela Voigt 
to develop an aggressive digital transformation plan to make the business operations more secure, more resistant to major crisis, and more agile. to know at the end of that, did Angela Boyd succeed? But anyway, there you go. Um, so without a doubt then, uh, I mean, the pandemic's brought huge changes uh, to uh, Clipper Marine's business operations. Uh, looked to be going so well at the start, then difficulties, and um, what are the future? Well, of course, that's uh, what we're talking about. Uh, before I turn to the panel, uh, you, like me, must have instant thoughts out of that. Uh, please do get in touch, either the systems, get your thoughts to us, your questions, your observations, and uh, we, will, uh, we will throw them around uh, within this panel. So uh, please do uh, get in touch. Uh, Margareta, uh, if I can ask you, first of all, so there we are, they're, they're now using their own devices. They um, are. What, I mean, as a lot of organisations are, what, what are the issues there? Look, I think it raises questions and concerns for lots of leadership teams around the UK and around the world right now as organisations try to flex as quickly as possible. So I think this is common for not just Clipper Marine, but for most organisations, public or private right now, where flexibility has been key. You know, we've responded really quickly. I think we heard they responded in 10 days to get their organisation working remotely. And I think the, the challenge that we've got with BYO devices and using our own devices is security. So security at the heart of this, it presents much greater levels of exposure. So really endpoint security at that. So really trying to protect those endpoints, looking at your private networks, your public networks, and really trying to lock those down and be secure developing a business continuity plans around that as well. So we are seeing a significant increase right now because of the exposure of the, the overnight shift in remote working and home working around ransomware attacks, phishing attacks. And with that now we're responding by putting in new kind of measures around multi-factor authentication, greater levels of uh, business continuity plans, but also really locking down those endpoints for security as well. It, it sounds, I mean, uh, opportunity maybe, but actually this sounds quite worrying, doesn't it? If Hugely worrying. We're these threats yeah. that are getting coming into companies now. Hugely, and I think overnight we've seen significant rises, like banks are seeing a, a, another huge increase in, in malware attacks and ransomware attacks overnight. So I think in the rush to try and get going again to drive productivity, we've done it really quickly. Now we need to try and get it right. And one of our customers recently said to us at, at Dell Technologies, you know, we've done it fast, now we need to get things right. So we're going to take a much more uh, holistic approach across our organization from not just uh, home working to our sales teams, but right through to our supply chain, right across the enterprise to say, how do we really tighten up security and risk management? So the most common security issues then are what? I was interested that this company seems to be, people seem to be able to use backdoor methods to get yes. in. Yeah. What are the big issues? I think the big one, we're seeing obviously third parties not fully locked down and secure. People have had to adjust their supply chains. They're using local suppliers rather than the trusted suppliers they've had for many years. So they're onboarding them quickly. Data has been spread around the place. People are working in different locations, particularly you know the recent days with the fine weather. People are working in all kinds of places. And so we're seeing information being accessed easier, public networks rather than private networks that are not secure. So lots of different threats. That will continue as we adapt to these new environments. And so I think it is about taking a holistic approach to resilience, right? So obviously we can touch about the technology tools and endpoint security is really important. Multi-factor authentication, understanding your third parties, your security, ID management, all of that is important. And then having leadership teams understand those threats, right? Because a lot of the time this has always been focused on the security team or the technology team understanding that. But actually this is everybody. It's everybody, yeah. absolutely. But Linda, I see, you, I see you nodding to a lot of that. This isn't something we can hang about. At. No, no, no. Actually, I think that um, what we've seen, uh, to Margareta's point, is that this is something that we absolutely have to run towards, is this uh, understanding the implications of security as we move to a remote working environment. To your point, something that will be with us um, as we continue uh, going forward. So we do need to address these needs holistically, um, again, to Margareta's point, not as a part of just the security team or even the information technology organization, but at the boardroom and at the executive level, and as a part of actually the company strategy, both in the short term and the long term, but building that resiliency that will last. Um, I think a lot of what we saw in the immediate reaction to the pandemic was very quick responsiveness. It was all responding. It was all urgency. Um, and I think now it's about building um, uh, infrastructure resiliency that will last the duration. So when things 
but hopefully we won't have a repeat of a global pandemic, but as things like that happen, uh, we're much more agile, flexible, uh, able to respond um, and deal with the security issues um, intrinsically um, as a part of just our daily operations. So I Sorry, to what extent are boardrooms taking that on board? So I, they, they moved urgently to start with, but now is it kind of, how do we solve this one? Yeah, I think, look, I think um, all boards um, have certainly security at the top of the list. Um, but I think, uh, and that's, and security is not a new issue at, at the board level. This is, you know, information technology security, physical, physical security. It's a, it's a top level board conversation, and I think it has been. I think what's interesting is some of these other concepts, remote working in particular, and um, the, the culture of re remote working, the technology around remote working, the security around remote working is also now a board issue, where boards are trying to understand how quickly can we get employees productive at home? Um, how secure is it? How is that data flowing? How do we protect our, um, our, our intelligence? Um, I think these are all, all concepts that the board is actually uh, caring about more than ever. And what's interesting is as I talk to executives and leadership at our customers, um, they're not actually sometimes used to the board having an interest in this longer term strategy well, around remote working. Yeah, it, it's become it has because, the board because board it's board become has. a priority. So that need to um, holistically look at this concept of remote working and the security around it is, is something that is really throughout the organization now. So transformation, um, a word we've been using, but yes. now, wow, I mean, Mark, transformation is this, uh, this is more, isn't it, than just how we work? properly in a different environment? Absolutely, Michael. Um, I think the pandemic has caused a seismic shift in thinking. The rush to home working, like we saw in that case, is really just the tip of the iceberg. It's a physical transition from the fixed desk in the office to home working, obviously. However, underneath that, Clipper Marine have got some serious business challenges. They mentioned the issue of getting a, a quote out to a customer. Now, they're clearly well established. They've been around for 170 years. So they've got a great brand. But they now have to tra do the hard bit and transform the rest of their business. And it sounds like their board has woken up to that. They've got the leadership galvanized around that challenge. And so now the really hard work begins. Uh, the shift to home working, relatively speaking, is the easier part. Actually re-engineering the business processes, changing the way they deliver those business processes, how they issue quotes to customers, how they manage the internal insurance risk, et cetera. That is the hard part. But now they've had that jolt. I would imagine most boards around the world are now thinking about how do they embrace this opportunity. Or is it sometimes re-engineering the board? I mean, I don't know, but, you know, <laughs> well, it's well, the, we, we heard there, there, was, you know, there were different indeed. opinions. And, and just one word on security. I think this rush to digital technology, security underpins that, mainly because trust is the most important aspect, I think, of the move to digital technologies. We all know that to embrace online banking as consumers, trust is the is right at the front so i think trust really is the issue that boards need to think about underpinning that of course is security but it also em embraces the issues of data as well i i think we're probably going to talk about trust quite a bit from all sorts of angles um it, it, it because it does come into so much doesn't it but also th the reason or the advantage for this transformation uh we've got to do it there are opportunities people want to work differently etc etc can you actually get a commercial advantage out of this? Well, there'll certainly be a commercial disadvantage if they don't hurry up because their competitors will certainly uh, be trying to catch them. But what they have that's a real advantage is their brand. What I heard in the case, they've been around for a substantial amount of time. Organisations uh, really do trust them. And so if they can embrace this, I think they can build a competitive advantage because building a brand is a long, long game. And that's not something you can create overnight. So if they can underpin that with digital technology, I would say yes, Michael, they can mm -hmm. build a, an advantage. I love that idea how if you don't do it, you've, you're building a commercial disadvantage. Yeah. That really does sum it up, doesn't it? Um, Clay, you're, you're running a business that has, has had to uh, adapt mm -hmm. to the demands of the pandemic. Do you, sure. do you sort of pick up on some of those challenges faced by Clipper Marine? Does, does sure. some of those ring with you? Sure. So I, I think it comes in two phases, Michael. Um, I think it starts with dealing with the here and now. And Margaret and others, we've talked about that. And so we got to get our workforce productive, right? They're, one, they're our, probably our primary asset, so making them productive. So Clipper or Atos or any of the businesses that we're talking about are quickly going to have to get those people productive again. But then you got to step back, right, and, and say, has the business changed or am I just making it virtual? 
and, and that's an opportunity and a threat, right, as Mark highlighted. So I, I look at health as probably a good example of that, where there's two things that I see happening inside of health. So one, we're now um, doing treatments, we're doing video assessments, right? We're doing um, video help, but that's really the same pathway that always existed. We're just now doing it remotely, right? We've jumped in and done everything by video, but basically the steps are still the same, right? You go see your GP, and then you go to get acute, and then you go, right, but all done remotely. That's one thing, but there's another one which is emerging, which is a fundamental redesign, and it's around self-care. Right? So if you look at, I think 30% of Google searches right now, people are turning around and saying, you know, are about medical questions. Whereas if you roll back, that wasn't true. So that's now a question of not redoing the same thing, but how do we get people to be more healthy, to self-serve, to take care of themselves? And then there is a market opportunity, right, for Clipper in the same light, right, to go step in and create a new value stream out of their position. Fascinating. You've broadened it out because I, I thought you were going to say, you know, the, the health, so now, health service are now doing it on video and so on, and, and that is a transformation. And you're actually saying, no, that's actually the same process, just done a bit, bit right. as it needs to be done. That's right. Completely trans... Has everybody got to completely transform and rethink? Um, I, 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 first thing you've got to do is deliver what you're delivering now, right? Which I think, you know, we, we've all gone to great efforts, and if you look at society, I think we've been, we've been pretty successful in that, right? We haven't had a whole bunch of things just stop, right? You know, trains are moving, planes, if we were able to, are, are still flying, right? We're still getting medical treatment, all those things, they're still proceeding. Um, but then you gotta step back and say, wait a second, there's a real opportunity here to do something different if you wanna take the, the time to think about it. But you have to step back, you won't do it if you're just in there maintaining the status quo in a new way. It's interesting, because Mark, you, you and I were talking b before we started about, about trains, weren't we? Yes, we were. Uh, you know, and just, just the idea of what happens, because although, yes, the trains have kept running, but for how long? Uh, mm. And all right, that's one example. Mm -hmm. But it is this transformation and this, this... Well, we all want to know how busy public transport is now, because we want to avoid busy trains. And in fact, you can get that information from Google Maps, but more importantly, if you have to maintain two metres of social distancing on public transport, the capacity is severely restrained, probably around 15%. So actually, the technology solutions are not just the whole story. There's also a policy challenge as well, I think, for public train operators. And that it's always taking and Michael, further, if I could, that, That's do? a perfect example about how the challenge has evolved. Right? So the first challenge was, let's keep everyone safe. Right, their families, loved ones, everything else. That was the first reaction. The second reaction was, let's make them productive as best we can right where they are, mm -hmm. right? So working from home. But the next one is a bit attitudinal, right? So if we want to bring people back to the office, if we think that's the right thing for each of our business models, how are we going to be comfortable doing that? And public transport is such an essential part of that that we've got to get everyone comfortable that, we, that it's safe to travel. We will talk a, about the public sector specifically a little later. Just back to Atos, have you, are the lessons you have learned in the last six months? Yeah, without a doubt. So I think the, the first thing is deal with what's in front of you and deal with it well, and then focus on dealing with the 80%. So by that, I mean 80% of it's predictable, right? We can kind of see out in two or three weeks what's coming, right? And now the next thing is getting people to feel comfortable back in the office. But if you dealt with the 80%, the 20% that you didn't anticipate is still within your confidence zone to handle. Whereas if you haven't dealt with the 80%, then it kind of, kind of feels like a big wave crashing over you. And that 20% then becomes somewhat overwhelming. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, thanks for the, those thoughts. Um, let's uh, take this opportunity to look at uh, questions coming in. Um, also, we're going to uh, do a poll now that uh, uh, you can take part in. Uh, so the poll button will be appearing in front of you, I hope, and all you need to do is click on the poll button. Uh, what will happen then is um, it's not hard. It's, it's uh, multi-choice questions, and uh, we're going to leave the poll open just for uh, probably six, uh, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, something like that. Do uh, press on the poll button, and uh, if you'd like to answer the question that I believe is appearing, we will come back to that uh, in just a moment. Right, let's take a, a question uh, that has come in, and uh, this is the moment where, of course, my technology and my phone locks. There we are, here we are. Uh, question, um, do insurance companies lead in creating a new dynamic, 
such as homeworking, or do they simply follow the market? Any thoughts on, anybody got thoughts on that one? Do insurance companies lead in creating a new dynamic, such as homeworking, or do they simply follow the market? Anybody know what lies behind the thinking yeah, there? Margareta, what are I your think, thoughts on that? I, I'm sure we all have probably thoughts. I think we're seeing some big insurance and small insurance players taking some quite innovative steps now around reshaping their business model, right? And, and I think home working, hybrid working more like it, because I think some people are actually opting to return back to safe and secure workplaces. Uh, but I think absolutely we're seeing a significant shift in the business model for insurance companies. And I think a lot of them are embracing this and taking the time, as you said, Clay, to kind of really reflect on how have they worked in the past, how are they going to work in the future, and how are they going to serve their customers in a digitally savvy, connected way, right? So I think a lot of them are going back to kind of the user experience and really revisiting their core purpose and how they're going to deliver services in a very new and connected way. And I, I think that's going to be right across the board, not just with insurance. It's going to be many businesses, but we are definitely seeing it with insurance companies right now. Well, that was what I was going to ask, wh whether it is actually different from any other company, any other organization, insurance companies. Clay, thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, it, it is slightly, but I mean, there, there are, there's analog an analogies, uh, right, analogous situations to public sector. So a lot of it um, in, in insurance, a, a lot of the risk management and the risk aversion is about, a, about authentication, so authenticating the individual. And a lot of that means sending paper back and forth, right, for them and somebody to testify that you are you and all these other things. Um, when actually we've had the ability to do a lot of that from a risk-based assessment digitally for some time, Right, and just think about contract signatures, all these other things, right? DocuSign, right? So why haven't we made that available to individuals, right, on insurance instead of having to go and find a friend to validate you are you, right? Use, use DocuSign to sign it. So I think insurance is moving rapidly, right, towards that more digital endorsement, digital authentication, whereas before, right, it was, it was a bit more of a paper-based solution. So some of the solutions are out there. It's just a case, really? Margaret, or just a case of... Uh, actually adopting the stuff Acceleration. that have done all along. Yeah, I, I think Clay hit the nail on the head. Right? Some of those technologies have already been there. They're quite mature, but uh, organizations have been slow and reluctant to fully embrace them. And now we're seeing this full-on acceleration of it, not just by insurance companies, banks doing it, applying for a mortgage. You can do it fully online with some banks now. Um, so I think we're going to see a kind of a revolution, embracement of digital tools, collaboration tools. We're not going to ask people to go back into physical places. You know, multi-factor authentication, um, all kinds of technologies will really facilitate an online experience of applying and, and using and tapping into these services. Okay, let's come to the poll because our panel can't wait to hear your first set of answers to the question, does your organisation allow employees to use their own devices for work purposes? Perhaps I should ask what you think the answer is on this one. There you go. I won't throw that at you this second. It's too cruel. Uh, but... Uh, we have 83% say yes, allow, bring your own device and so on. 16% say no. 16% of organisations represented in our audience say no, you can't bring your own device. Is that to be expected? Is that, does that have to change? Is that sometimes necessary? Reactions to that, 83% say yep, 16% say no. Somehow that adds up to 99%. Somehow Somebody doesn't know. It all always seems yeah. to apply in life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Sorry. there will be some businesses where it is quite hard because they're quite physical. Um, you know, if you're running uh, a railway line, for example, you're a network rail, there's a very physical set of infrastructures, uh, very critical to the nation. And so, you know, the level of home working in a business like that is, can be quite challenging. A business like mine is pretty straightforward, as you'd expect in the, the IT world. So I think, Michael... I'm not surprised. I was going to guess 80% if you'd have asked me the question because <laughs> I bet you a would. safe bet. <laughs> Is this, uh, do you think the, the, this, this percentage that say no, uh, have they, I mean, we don't know if they, they're working on changing it. Do you think they, they have to work on changing it or there's some organisations it will be fair enough to always say no? I think there's some, um, to Mark's point, there's some industries, there's some businesses where there will always be a need, I think, to say no to um, the, uh, the personal devices, but I think um, as long as there's an option um, for everyone else to be able to use your own device, I think that's, especially when it comes to even 
um, recruitment and hiring and what um, the public and employees are looking for. They want to be able to use their own device and we need to have those capabilities even if you think of it from a retention perspective or a, a talent attraction perspective. Um, so being able to have those capabilities within the organization I think is important but I do think there will always be a certain percentage within any company um, and, and many um, industries where there will be a restriction on you have to use a company device due to very specific security issues or... But this um, is the challenge. And actually, the 83% is fascinating. Yes. That, that, that do allow it, and hopefully the systems are there. Okay, another question here. This is uh, Mark, Broad, uh, Mark from Broadcom who says, uh, interestingly, JP Morgan wants its employees back and Facebook is buying, <laughs> Facebook is buying 37,000 square metres of offices. Remote work seems not to be so ideal. JP Morgan wants its employees back in and Facebook is buying, is buying office space. Um, is, is the trend going backwards? What do we think? I, th I think, I think it's, we're going to see it mixed. I think there's um, overwhelmingly when, uh, you know, some data that we've commissioned is that employees want the option to work from home. I think this has taught companies, it's taught uh, people that, the, you know, that the capability that they have to do a lot of work uh, from home is absolutely there when the right technology foundation is in place and there's a strong desire to at least have that flexibility. At the same time, um, you know, even some of the discussion over the last few weeks about the return to work even in the city of London, there's a strong desire to get back to the office to support the businesses that are in the city. I mean, there's a lot of competing um, uh, issues relative to, uh, to office work versus homework and I think that um, I, I don't know that we've solved the exact problem, or if there is one. Um, I know there are many solutions, 